So good afternoon, everyone. We're here today for another AI guest speaker series, and our guest today is Jeyu. Jeyu is a PhD student at the University of Washington. He is advised by Snorkel's very own CEO, Alex Ratner, as well as Professor Ranjai Krishna, right? Yeah, and uh, today he will be talking about his uh, latest work, Task Me Anything. So uh, without any further ado, uh, Jeyu, the stage is yours. Go ahead. Thanks for the invitation today. I'm going to talk about our recent work, Task Me Anything. So the motivation is right now we have so many, so many different foundation models, right? So many different multimodal language models from different organizations. And we, we also have so many benchmarks for these uh, from uh, multimodal foundation models nowadays. But then there is a question here for every single users, what benchmark we should use for our, for, the own, for our own use case? Because different users may use foundation models for different purposes, right? So our solution to this question is we just generate your own benchmark for your own use case instead of searching from the huge amount of benchmarks nowadays to find the one that fits your um, needs. So that is Task Me Anything. So first of all, Task Me Anything is a user-centric gen benchmark generation system. So, so we can generate a benchmark that fits our own needs. And the, the Task Me Anything adopts first row generation. So there's zero AI model involved. All the tasks in in task me anything are generated by program. So it's also called like programmatic benchmark generation. So that we can have full control and the guaranteed correctness of the generated benchmark. Thirdly, the task me anything has a combinatorial task space. So the space is very huge and it's also very easy to maintain and expand. Finally, we support fine grained user queries with own budget approximation because right now we have so large uh, task space and the user and it is very expensive for users to test a single model against all the possible tasks we can generate so that we enable so so we enable this kind of on budget approximation for users to get to know their model with the budget they have first of all the overall workflow of task me anything is like the user first come with some user queries like which model is best at recognizing planes or what objects GPT-4 bad at recognizing when they rotate. So these two types of queries co corresponds to two general use cases of model. The first one is the downstream applications, the model, uh, they, the user may want to know what, which model is best. And then the second one is about the, it's for model developers. They may want to know the weakness or the strengths of their models where they can improve. So once we have these user queries, and then we also have the task space, the universe of the universe of the tasks, and then the user can identify those relevant tasks from this huge task space. Okay, so right now we only identify the task in the sense of we know there are we conceptually know there are some tasks we can generate, but we haven't generated that. So here, all these dot, dots here are just conceptual representation of these tasks. And once we identify the task that we are interested in, then we set out to actually generate this task. So here we are evaluating multi-model foundation models. So we adopt a VQA format for, for our task. So here, once we identify those relevant tasks, then we generate this concrete VQA task instance with image, question, and choice and ground truth, and then we just a quick question. Uh, not everybody in our audience might be familiar with VQA. Can you just okay, briefly sure. explain what VQA is? Sure. Mm -hmm. So VQA is um, just normal QA for text model plus one image. So 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 VQA is called visual question answering. So that is given one image, we can ask some question about this image. So VQA task is usually used to test those multimodal foundation model like GPT-4 vision or GPT-4. Okay, so once we get this concrete task instance, we kind of generate a small benchmark we need, and then we can evaluate the models on the generated benchmark, and then do the, all the analysis or find the model we want to use. So that's the general workflow of task me anything. 
So then we can go to some technical details. So basically, how does task mean anything, anything actually generate a task? First of all, we have a huge task space, but these dots here are just what we call task plans. So task plans is as simple as a Python dictionary that contains the metadata of the task and all the configurations that needed to generate a task. So for example, the task plan may contain the objects, right? All the objects we are interested in, like apple, banana, all the task type, like counting task, recognition task, this kind of task metadata. And once we identify those task plans that we are interested in, then we just input this task plan to some task generator. So here a task generator is just Python code. And then this Python code will use this task plan, this configuration metadata with some actual source, like 3D objects with annotations to actually generate the image. So here we are showing a video below source of video QA. So using the using the these basic 3D models and the Python code, we can actually generate a video where the objects are rotating and placed in different parts of the tabletop. And then we can also programmatically generate a question using some templates. And we can also generate a ground truth answer and all the negative answers. So this video, question, and the option, and the ground truth answer, these four elements compose a concrete task instance here. So that's how we generate a concrete task instance. And we can also leverage real videos or real images with single graph annotations to also generate this task. So here we are generating an image from scratch using some 3D graphic engines, but we can also use real video as long as we have some annotation there. So what does the task space actually look like? So the task space is combinatorial or compositional because the world is also compositional or guardian exists. So, so that is a call of love from a kind of famous mathematician. So, so right now we support different uh, visual concepts. We, we have more than 300 object categories supported in Task Me Anything, and we support more than 600 attributes and more than 300 relationships. And you can already imagine if we compose these di different visual concepts, in a, we, we can have a very huge combinatorial space and we can generate a huge amount of tasks. And here we, we support 28 task generators. And together, these task generators plus these visual concepts, we can generate over 750 million image query or video query tasks. So we can see a comparison of the task space of a task mean anything to some existing VQA benchmarks, like the a uh, benchmark we are using right now for GPT-4, we kind of model like MMBench, MMU, they are typically just thousands or tens of ten, tens of thousands of tasks. And the, even other e existing VQA benchmark generated by program like program, like GQA, they, they only have 22 million tasks. But we, we can easily generate seven hundred more than 700 million VQA tasks. And we can also see how, how we design a space. So basically we have five different scenarios, three for image QA and a two for video QA. So the first scenario is we just copy paste those 2D images of certain object into white background. And then we can already ask many questions like how many questions, like what question, where question, and what attribute or where attribute kind of question. And then the second scenario is, okay, we actually place these 3D objects into a 3D scene and use Blender to actually render the 2D images. So this scenario, we have more realistic images than the first one. And we and because now we have 3D kind of a 2D image from a 3D scene. So now we can add more type of question that regarding the 3D kind of spatial relationship of this object or even a size comparison between objects. And finally, if we have real image and a scene graph, we can also generate um, many questions based on the scene graph annotation. And then the same idea can be applied to video. So we can use Blender 
to generate this video by placing object in the tabletop and uh, kind of rotating or move the object around. And we can also use real videos with single off. And here we have uh, different categorizations for the skills that we are testing on. Like for example, the, the basic one, we, we can use how many tasks to generate to evaluate models counting capability. And for you using the where kind of question to evaluate models spatial understanding. And we can also evaluate those relation recognition, edge flow recognition, 3D edge flow recognition, object recognition, all kinds of um, basic perception skills for multimodal foundation models. The task means anything task space is very easy to explain. Right now, we only use those like several hundreds of objects with ground truth annotations, but we can add more and more objects from uh, more and more 3D objects from either ShapeNet or Objectverse XLO. And we, we, we only need to annotate like several hundreds of 3D objects. We can already generate 700 million of tasks. So if we further expand our space, um, expand the object set we have, then the space will go exponentially because it's a combi combinatorial space. And we can also expand the space by just add a new generator. So right now we only have 28 uh, task generators, but the user can implement their own generators, use all the ingredients we have right now to test new capability they care about the model. So what kind of user queries we actually support and how we handle them besides those normal, yeah, so first we have these normal user queries regarding the model performance, like which model is best. But we also have these fine grain queries regarding individual vis visual concepts like object, attribute, and the relation. So basically the user can ask what kind of object is GP4O bad at recognizing? So specifically, we support four times fine grain user query. The first one is top K. Top K means, okay, we can find the top five objects that the GPT-4 is worst at recognizing when these objects are rotating. And we also support threshold kind of query. So threshold query means we can identify colors that the GPT-4 recognize with less than 30% average accuracy. And we also support model compare. So where we can compare two models and then find the objects that one model is better than than the other. And then we can also we can also support model debug where we can identify tasks or objects where one model performs significant work worse than its average performance. Okay. So all these kind of fine grain user queries is enabled by task me anything and not other existing static bank benchmarks. But there's there's a question. This kind of fine grain queries may involve so many tasks to evaluate. For example, if we want to know the top K objects that the model is bad at, then that means we have to evaluate all the like 600 ob objects we have, and then that may lead to thousands of tasks, thousands of inference of the model. We have some approximation for this process, but before that, we should first talk about how we execute this query. So here, let, let's see. We have this color query, which is short. So this one is about the threshold, the color, the colors whose performance is larger than 0.5. So from this two model average. And first of all, we, we can have all the possible task plans in a table. It's just as simple as a relational table, like a pandas data frame, right? We can have all these tables and the 700 million, like, a table of 700 million laws, entries, but it's still doable because there's no image here, it's just a table. And then we can filter this table to, to find those tasks we are, to find those task plans we are interested in. And then in the second step, we, we, now we use this task plan to generate the tasks on the fly. And then we e evaluate the model to get a new table where we have the model as a, a, a separate column and the, the column, the value here is the model's performance on a specific task. So, so during this process, we don't have to actually save those colors. Otherwise, uh, sorry, those images or those tasks 
otherwise it will be very expensive to to store seven hundred million of tasks. So right now we just generate tasks on the fly, and we evaluate the model, and we get the model accuracy. That that's all we can even de discuss the task we just generated. Okay, so once we have this table, this new table, then we just do a normal like database or query operation. We just aggregate the table and then get the accuracy for the two colors, like red and black here. And then we just select the one that is larger than 0.5 as you support. I have a quick question here. So uh, what are you using to parse the query execution into the so like you, uh, this query, the color attributes on which minimum performance of model M1, M2 average over tasks within the group is larger than 0 0.5. So um, how are you breaking that down into these are the attributes, these are the colors, these are the scores? Like what is doing that part? So so you, so you right now, users are doing that part. The user is doing yeah, that. Okay. So, so user themselves have to transfer their query to kind of SQL-like code or Python oh, okay, code. Okay. But, but we are working on using large language model to do that for user. Okay. So, so, so right now to use task me, anything the user have to know how to code, how to okay. use Python or SQL like, mm -hmm. you know, query language. But in the future, we, we, we will have a large language model to help transfer this natural instruct, a natural language query into the executable code to run task me anything. Okay, so in this case, a user would say, I'm doing a threshold task. My attribute is this. Mm -hmm. The colors I care about is this. Yes. And the models I care about are so and so now. Okay. So there's like some sort of a config that the human is yes. inputting. Okay. Yes. Okay. So 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 on the user side, they are just like, okay, they got this uh like big table, like pandas data frame. Mm -hmm. Then then they just code several filter functions on the data frame. Mm -hmm. Then they then everything is done. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so how how can we do the uh, approximation? So so we actually do the approximation for the second state for this generation and the evaluation state. And then f first of all, we, we can see these task plans for every single task is actually a very natural representation of the task. Okay, so now we have the embedding or representation of every task, and we also can get some kind of model performance on each task, then what we can do, we can change a model, change a machine learning model to feed this task to model performance function. And then we can leverage that function to do a approximation. So that's the main idea. So now let's go to the details. So first of all, we have random. So random is just a naive baseline. So for example, the user may say, okay, I only have 1,000 budget. Then we just sample 1,000 tasks from all the filtered tasks, and then use the result on this 1,000 task as the approximation of the whole table and adjust the query. But also the, the second method called fitting, which means, okay, I still have only have 1,000, and I only evaluate 1,000 tasks, but now I have 1,000 tasks to model performance pairs. Then why don't we use these 1,000 pairs to train a machine learning model? And then we use this model to predict the value, predict the accuracy of the model for all the remaining tasks. And then we can use both these actual evaluated pairs and those predict value from the model we just shown. Combine, combine both to adjust the user query. So that is called fitting. Okay, now with this random and the fitting, now we know we can have an active learning kind of method, right? So it's very similar to fitting, but instead of we just do a do one thousand do a batch of one thousand evaluation and fit on the model once, we can actually we we first start with a very a smaller subset, right? And we change initial function, and then we can use this predictor, this initial predictor, to do the sample active learning query strategy. We can use this function to guide us what is the next batch of tasks we should evaluate on. And then we, we, we have some method to sample the task instance that are most likely to improve the query approximation results. So that is, so this method is called active. Okay. And we include show like active 
is much better than the other two in terms of approximation accuracy and the budget efficiency. Yeah, but I don't have the results here, but that, that's our conclusion. So finally, with this system out there, so what we have done with that, first of all, we have we generate a random set of task instance, and we use this random subset of tasks to evaluate 18 multimodal language models to gain a sense of um, overall performance of these models. And then we also have a database called Task Me Anything DB, where we actually evaluate 13 open source uh, multimodal language models over 1 million task instance we generate. And then we, we store this evaluation results into a database. And then this database can be used to, uh, for future study of how we do the model performance approximation. And we also use this evaluation results database to do some analysis. Okay. And finally, we have the UI, the task me anything UI. This user, this graphic interface is also built on this database. So this interface is not for real-time model testing, but it's just for users to explore this database where we already have the evaluation results. But the point here is like, compared to static benchmark we have seen every day, we can only see the score in the leaderboard, right? But with this task anything system, with this graphical interface, we can actually perform those queries, those top K threshold queries we just mentioned on this interface. But what we have found from these experiments we, we, we have done. So first of all, we have, um, so these figures are from the random subset I just introduced. And uh, we test many both closed source and uh, both open source and closed source models. And we actually tried two different prompts. One is called detail prompt and the, the other one is more concise, more human-like. So the detail prompt will give a very detailed instruction of how users should output the uh, choice or pick the right answer. And the, uh, the, the more concise human-like one is it, it's just Q and A, nothing else. And we actually see, okay, first of all, these models are very sensitive to the problem and they, sens they are sensitive to the problem in different ways. Like for example, for gp 4 o and these closed source kind of models, they prefer those sustained prompt, those concise prompt, more human-like prompt. But for, for those smaller open source model like Instruct Bleed, they actually prefer the detail prompts. So I guess that um, has something to do with how they train the model. But uh, uh, the conclusion is the model is very sensitive to the prompt, to the template of the QA we are using. And also we can see nowadays for a uh, multimodal language model, those uh, very recent open source model like Intern VL and the Lava Next, they are kind of comparable to GPT-4 vision and GPT-4 and even better. Okay, so that's on a random subset. And we also kind of study on the, the skills and the multimodal language models. So like what skills are multimodal language model best and what's at and what is the best model for each specific skill. Like I mentioned, for all those tasks, we have some categorization of the skills on those tasks generators. So now we can do these studies and we can see different models actually have quite different expertise, like for both image and the videos. And then this finding, like this observation is even more significant for video model, because we can see their, their shape are quite different. That's about like skill level comparison. And we, we also study how those small models compare as against large models. Okay, and for most of the skills and for most cases, larger model is better than small model. So here we compare those, um, so all the model included here are open source model. So we kind of compare in 13 billion versus a two in 
7 billion and uh, also compare uh, QVM chat versus Q QVM, like and Lava 13 billion versus Lava 7 billion to, to, to compare these large and small models. And in most of the cases, large model is better, but if, but there are exceptions, like for in sharp bleed model, for the relation recognition, we actually found that the smaller model is actually significant, like statistically significant, significantly better than a lot larger model. And then we we also do the kind of fine grain query we just mentioned on the like most pop. Popular model nowadays, the GPT-4 model, and we actually ask different queries. The first query we ask is what the relation of GPT-4 bad and outstanding, and we can see the GPT-4. So, so here we have two categories. So it might be hard to to see the relation category, but this one is interactional, and this one is a spatial. Uh, what do these two? Um... Relations mean like what is interaction? Yeah. So spatial relation is basically okay. We can ask two object like to the left of or to the right of, mm -hmm. and the interactional is more like I'm kind of holding this, ho holding this water bottle, really kind of action, kind of relation. Okay. Okay. Yes. So we can see for image QA the uh, GPT falls spatial relation recognition is better than interactional but for video is in the opposite way this is actually very interesting and makes sense because for image it's easy for us to identify the spatial relation between two objects but those action based relations are kind of hard to recognize but for video that is a different case for video, because we so so video can capture the actions by multiple frames. So here, interactional relation recognition become easier in video camping. But for spatial, because of the video, the camera may may move, right? So 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 our viewpoint may also move. Then that may make the spatial relation recognition a little bit harder in video too. Okay, so. What's more interesting is what we actually ask what objects are to for all bad at recognizing when they're rotating and uh, moving. So we actually found, okay, for rotating objects and also for moving objects, we can see the GP4 is very good at recognizing animal. So this one is animal and this one is bicycle. But it's bad at like food. This blue one is food and this, um, this yellow one is furniture, and the, this purple one is plant. This pink, pink or purple one is plant. This is also very interesting because for video QA, like we expect objects like animal and vehicle, they are moving, they are rotating in videos, yeah. but we don't see objects like food or furniture and plant, they are moving or rotating. I guess that kind of that bias in the real world distribution is encoded by GP40 and they explain why GP40 can recognize animal and vehicle better than food and the plant and the furniture when they are rotating or moving. So I guess this kind of leads to the question how much of the movement or the rotation is it understanding because it expects animals and vehicles to move versus yeah whether they're actually moving. Yeah. So here the question we ask, we generate it's more like we have the tabletop and we, and we put an animal object or food object there and we just rotate this food mm -hmm. and the animal and then we ask what is the object that is rotating or uh, that is rotating clockwisely or counterclockwisely. Okay. So 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 it's still a, a object recognition task, but it's just the object is lo mm -hmm. rotating. And third, we also asked about attributes. So see like how GPT-4 performs for different attributes. And uh, in general, for, for 2D, the GPT-4 is better at shape, material, materials, than colors. And also that's the same case for 3D, but now shape is a little bit better. So, so this also makes sense because the 2D task I'm uh, here it's just we copy paste the 2D image to a white background. 
But the 3D what Edge of the Task is built upon the uh, the 3D scene and the render 3D rendering images, so they encode more 3D information. So a quick question here. So I think in the uh, first table it says, uh, so what attributes of objects are GPT oh bad at recognizing? So G in images, GPT four is better at recognizing moods than color. Um, yes. Oh, no, no. So here the Y is accuracy. So so GPT is better than mood. So it, GPT four understands persons like so mood is like a person's angry yeah, face yeah. or sad face. Yeah. So it's better at recognizing that than yes. the color. Than color. Wow. Okay. Yes. The, I, I find that very unexpected. Yeah. Um, but that might be because the that like the color we 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 have a larger color vocabulary, but the mood vocabulary maybe it's just five or six. Okay. So so it, it's also about the granularity of these edge build vocabularies. Okay. Yeah. And also for color, it's more like there are some very there are some colors that are very kind of little difference. It's very hard mm -hmm. to recognize even by human. Like dark blue, navy blue. Those uh, kind of... Yeah, yeah. Kind oh. of like yellow and orange. Mm -hmm. This kind of, yes. Confusing colors. And apart from task me, anything what I'm doing during my PhD is okay, learning with programmatic data. And I guess everyone here know what is learning with programmatic data. But I still want to say a little bit about that. So first of all, okay, programmatic data labeling, we, we're all familiar with, right? And then the second one is programmatic data ge ge generation. So we kind of try to generate diverse training data, training data with programmatic generators or like Python codes. And then the last one is programmatic benchmark synthesize. So synthesizing benchmark for different use cases. That is about task me anything I just talked about. So for the programmatic data labeling, I don't think I need to say 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 anymore. So I, so I can talk a little bit about programmatic data generation. So here, programmatic genera uh, data generation is different from data labeling because data labeling we have X and we try to get a Y. But for programmatic data generation, we are more like we have Y. We, we just want to generate X. Okay. So here, uh, in this work, we are doing a in in this work we are doing a text classification task. We we want to train a text classifier and we want to get a data from ChatGPT. Okay. And then the simple baseline here is we can just like ask the GPT to generate some news related to sports or related to the categories we care about. But in this work, we say, okay, we, we actually can do that better. So how, so, so we first generate some attributes by interact with the GPT and at least attributes that like the length of the article and also the style of the article or subtopic or location of the article. We, we first identify some attributes of the data, the article, the news article we care about. And then instead of naively from the GPT for um, data belonging to some X, we instead we perform a GPT to generate some data that let not only belongs to this specific category, but also have these different attribute combinations. And here we are also seeing a combinatorial space, right? And by combining all, all these attributes, we, we, we can have more budget efficient way to query, to generate data from GPT. So that's the main idea. Yeah, and then in the future, I'm gonna expand this, the, the whole picture and to, to like learning from a pro programmatic war. Yeah. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Can you go back to that slide where you had the performance of models based on detailed or um, concise requests? Yeah. Yeah, that one there. You interacted with all of these through APIs, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this might be a little bit of a silly question, but do you think some of the solid performance on some of these APIs some of these closed source models might be prompt enrichment that's going on uh, that you can't see? I believe so. At least for um, image generation model, I do know they have some prompt enhancement. But for kind of QA, like text completion model, I'm not quite sure, but maybe they have some. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. I know that's something that some people are messing around with, but I, I have honestly no idea where it's deployed, and I didn't know if you had a sense. So, so, so this is actually a very concerning kind of issue in foundation models, because sometimes the different prompts can lead to a accuracy like various like 10 10 10 percent of drop of or boost so and the, all the benchmark i have seen they kind of use different forms so so all i should say they cheat the model as the method instead of the model plus the prompt as the method but mm -hmm. if you only cheat the model as the method that's not accurate for how we evaluate this model so I put I personally think we should no so in the future, no matter what kind of evaluation we want to do for foundation models, we should always cheat the model plus the specific form template as the method. Even though the template is just okay, we say uh, please answer the following question, or we just give the question first and say please pick from the pick from the following options. This simple instruction will can can also affect the model's performance, but at least are uh, like like technically overlooked by by people. Actually, I had a question regarding the uh, the active learning approximation. Can, uh, can you just briefly explain that a bit more? Like how exactly? So you're saying that if I have a limited budget, say thousand experiments to run, so um, you'll say start running with a batch of ten, mm. and then you'll use active learning to say which experiments I should run in my pre in my remaining budget of 950 so that my approximation is most accurate? Yes. So yeah, that's a very nice question because the query function, the query strategy is, is actually different from for different uh, queries. Mm -hmm. So for example, for the top K query, mm -hmm. the, the query function is actually, okay, based, we, we use the current uh, approximator, current predictor, to get the accuracy of all the tasks. And then we kind of pick the top K to evaluate. Mm -hmm. Because this top K query only cares about the top K. So so we so we should always try to evaluate those tasks that are very likely in the top K errors. So for the, so for this one is more like Bayesian optimization of black box optimization. But for the threshold one, it's a little bit different. So for this whole one, we are at actually each time we query the task that the model predicts, like sitting around the boundary. Like here, the boundary is 0.3 accuracy. Mm -hmm. And then we, we, we will try to evaluate the task that the model predicts are more, like most close to 0.3, like 0.31 or 0.29. So some plus or minus epsilon. Yes, yes, the, 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 the most close one. Mm -hmm. Because for first holding, instead of we do kind of optimization kind of stuff, we, we are more like interested in to know the boundary between tasks that are larger than three point uh larger than thirty percent or lower than thirty percent. We want to know the boundary. So here the top K is more like optimization, but the first hole is more like binary classification. So we have different query um for, for this different type of uh, different query function for this different type of query. So the active learning active learning algorithm changes based on what the query function is. Yes. Or like the estimation strategy is diff changes based on what kind of query you're asking. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So for like uh, say top five objects that GPT four is best or worst at recognizing. So would you like at first you'll do like fifty or hundred objects. And out of those 100 objects, you'll see that there's a collection of 10 or 20 that are doing the worst. So then you'll repeat your remaining budget on those 10 or 20 objects? Uh, no. If the target is object, then we will, then we will not um, repeat the object we already e evaluate. Okay. So we will go out to other objects. So, mm -hmm. so, 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 yeah, that's the point. So actually, when we, uh, when we embed these past plans, Mm -hmm. We are not using this ca categorical like table as the input of the model. We actually transfer this this every law of this table to a text description, and then we use a, a bird to get the 
sentence in, embedding as the input to the predictor we are training. Why? Because in this case, the, the, the model may, so, so we have kind of have a assumption here is like, okay, so here is the telephone, right? And then maybe there is another object, cell phone. And, and the model's performance on cell phone and the telephone may be similar to each other. So that kind of similarity can be captured by these tags embedding rather than plan categorical representation. So, that, so that's why we only evaluate like 10 objects and then we train the model and then the, the model may kind of know what, what other objects looks like. So kind of have this generalization based on the embedding, the text embedding similarity. Mm -hmm.